turnip. Yeah. Got a glare coming from here. Oh, that's this? You can turn that down. With that one. It's yours. Over your deck. Hey, everybody. Good to see you. Yay! There's people here. Is the lighting okay? Yeah. Okay. Sound off in chat if you want us to change anything about the lighting. Hi from the Shapeshifters' former studio, i.e. our dining room. Our third one, yeah. It was the very first Vermont Shapeshifters studio. Yeah. Anyways, click on chat and say hi. Sound off if you're in. That's just me. It's just you. Cool. I'm watching the chat, so if you've got any questions or want to say anything, well, you know, I'm watching it so we can. Yeah, I posted to Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr, but not to Instagram. People will show up. Yeah. It's exactly three. <laughs> so should we introduce ourselves since you did share it to spaces where... That's true. They don't necessarily know shapeshifters. Should we wait for more than two people? Oh, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Let's chill out. Anyway, hi, number one fander. <laughs> I hope everything is going as well with you as possibly can be. I'll let us know if the music is too high. We'll turn it down. Yeah. But yeah, this is our apartment. <laughs> so you can excuse the noise quality. The ceilings here are like uh, eight feet lower than in the cotton mill like um, you do but yeah we figured we'd do something a little bit more casual and uh since most of y'all don't have a an industrial a pair of industrial sewing machines at home we would do this so along on wanda who we introduced last time yep our one remaining uh home sewing machine yeah. tabletop sewing machine Rest in peace to Al and Victor and the other, <laughs> and Octavia. Yeah. But this is Wanda. She's our home sewing machine, and we will be making uh, cloth masks on Wanda today because that's a lot, that's the easiest possible thing to follow along at home with. There's more people. Hello, more people. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be making a few of these. Uh, this one is my personal one. I made it for myself so that I can wear it outside, and the loops go around your ears like so and it's got uh, and it, then it gets caught on your glasses and it's got scales on it because that's kind of our brand I guess <laughs> a little bit our brand because of course even when we were just looking for cotton we were able to find scales um yeah ours are identical well they the fabric is identical but we can tell them apart because we use different thread on them <laughs> If you're making one for yourself, it's important to know which one is yours. If you don't have a particular cotton that you know definitely is your combination, mark it with a Sharpie or something. Um, yeah, so the ones we're making today are going to go to Brattleboro Memorial Hospital, which is our local hospital. I linked a pattern in the description, and we're going to be making according to that pattern. And all next week, we're going to be making masks and dropping them off at Brat Memorial Hospital, uh, the BMH drop-off point is also in the description. Um, just to be clear, this is the pattern that, or one of the patterns that our hospital gave us when we asked for information. That might vary uh, depending on what hospital you're talking to. Um, so if you are planning on donating, it's probably a good idea to contact them first about what pattern they would prefer you use. Um, I don't know that there's a whole lot of variation between the there's, different patterns, but... There's some. Um, if you are not local, I've also linked the Relief Crafters of America down in the description. And the Relief Crafters of America are very good and on top of what hospitals in your local area are looking for in terms of homemade masks. So if you're not in Southern Vermont, Go to that link, talk to the Relief Crafters of America, or rather look through their incredibly good database that they have put together in a matter of days uh, and find the hospital near you and see what they are asking for. Because it may be different. Um, even here in Brattleboro, there has been some argument over whether or not it is okay to use cotton flannel 
Mm. And uh, our local mask sewing Facebook group says, no flannel, it's too hot. But the Brattleboro Memorial Hospital uh, pattern says, flannel's okay, we can take it. So it's, these things are living documents, they're ongoing debates. Yeah, and that'll also be something that they can decide on site, yep. you know, yep. uh, because they are, uh, they as soon as they get them, they are absolutely, you know, going through them, making sure that they're up to spec and throwing them into the laundry to disinfect uh, before they actually hand them out to nurses and doctors and everyone. Yeah. The important thing right now is to make them. It is not to make them perfect or right. to make them precisely to spec. I mean, that's a, a homemade is handmade. Even like handmade stuff made by professionals, like our handmade stuff isn't always exactly perfect. It's never going to be like what a machine can do. And if they were good with machine stuff, they would not be asking home sewers to do it. Mm -hmm. But they are. So here we are making masks in a home sewing setting. So what Eli is doing right now, um, yeah. we don't know about elsewhere in the country, but here in Vermont, there's been a severe lack of uh, flat elastic. Um, with the ones that we made for us, we used this uh, spandex trim that we happen to have on hand, um, but it's getting harder and harder to find. So what we found is that you can use spandex, which we also just happen to have a lot of lying around. Uh, if you cut it thin enough, if you just give it a good hard stretch, it'll curl right up. Here, let me. Here. here. Right in front of the camera here. See, this is nice and flat right now. If you give it a hard tug, it'll just roll up. And so we are home making elastic ear loops by cutting strips of spandex. This needs to be cut a little bit more. I think I probably cut that on the oh, hold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cutting strips of spandex and then tugging them and then making a pile. And I'm just doing that to keep my hands busy because I'm one of those people who always needs to keep their hands busy. But we do have a few more people in. Hello, say hi in chat if you want to. Should we introduce ourselves now? Yeah, let's do an introduction. Yeah. Right. So for those of you who don't know shapeshifters, um, we are a custom made, handmade, made to order uh, binder and sports bra company out of Brattleboro, Vermont. Um, my name is Krista. My pronouns are she and they. My name is Eli. My pronouns are they, them. And we're the co-owners. Uh, we have two part-time employees who are currently doing what they need to do to take care of themselves and their families. Um, so we have switch to making face masks, which has been an adventure. Uh, remembering how to work with non-stretch fabric that uh, unravels. <laughs> it's been a while since either of us touched quilting cotton. So it's been a really fun week, honestly. Yeah, every once in a while, you know, we'll help out doing uh, costumes for some of the local theater companies or the, the local circus college, but it's not very often. <laughs> Yes, trans flag spandex. We're absolutely making masks out of that and sending that to the hospital. <laughs> it's just going to happen that way. The thing about the spandex also that comes through our shop is that it is often just very fun. I have this pattern of hexagons in space that I'm going to be cutting into ear loop strips later. And it's a scrap that is too small to be made into a garment in our regular business. So I just kept it around and now it gets to be put to use. Which I'm really happy about. And I'm sure the, I mean, we were talking about this yesterday while we were going shopping. Uh, we have a local ish uh, discount fabric supplier near us. And we just bought 40 yards. 40 yards. 40 yards of cotton. Um, yeah. And he had plenty more. Uh, because most of the local sewers around here are uh, quilters. So we, we highly suspect that the hospitals are going to be getting some fun uh, face masks. Right. So if you're in southern to central Vermont or New Hampshire, call up Frank at Frank's Bargain Center and ask him for cotton if you need cotton. He because... has plenty left. We got there um, at the end of the day, at the end of the week, um, right before uh, New Hampshire was putting up their 
uh, no retail rules. Degree, yeah. Yeah, um, and he still had three and a half-ish full aisles of cotton um, that we saw. That doesn't include like the remnants that he has and the uh, the ends, like the fabric ends. So, and he will also have spandex if you want to cut your own ear ties. Well, so, not spandex, he has lycra. Lycra. <laughs> So yeah, give Frank a call, see if he can deliver to you. Yeah, um, he did say that he's, he's going to cool. be doing online ordering. Yeah. Um, yeah, and he had also said that he, that week had sold like 2,300 yards. Thousand. 23,000. Sorry, 23,000 yards of cotton. And he still had plenty left. Yeah. So if you are looking for cotton. Um, Frank's Bargain Center, Claremont, New Hampshire. Yeah. Check him out. Yeah, I don't know what Joanne's <laughs> stock looks like right now, but. He's doing good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, I've made, I've meanwhile stretched out a whole bunch of ear ties. Shall we get started? Yeah. On the pattern. All right. Let's take this. So um, we're going to start on my side because I'm cutting fabric. Uh, we do have a whole bunch of rectangles pre cut, but we wanted to go through the whole process. And it's a little small. Um, so, can you what? Go for it. Go ahead. <laughs> well, I was going to get started. You seemed like you wanted to say something before we start. Just that uh, I said in all of the event descriptions or the live stream descriptions that you will need two rectangles of nine inch by six inch, hundred percent cotton fabric. What Chris is doing now is cutting out those rectangles. If you happen to have cotton fabric that you haven't cut yet join along right yeah if you do then we'll get to you shortly um naomi craig asks is it a particular weave of cotton that you need flat weave uh quilters cotton is what i'm seeing most often from people that's the need um yeah so pretty much anything with pretty patterns on it <laughs> yeah yeah i have stuff not... that you would use to make like sheets yeah i haven't seen anything to say that something like a satin weave or a duck weave is unwelcome, though a duck would be super heavy. Mm. So I wouldn't do that. Um, one of the main thing, one of the main features of these things is that it needs to be breathable because if you can't breathe in it, you're gonna take it off anyways. Right. And also, like I'm assuming you mean like upholstery type yeah. fabric, which is like really thick and it's also scratchy. Yeah. And you don't want, you know, that against your face, which is part of what the conversation about uh Flannel. flannel that's why that's happening is because some people are really sensitive on their face to uh touch and like regular cotton can be kind of stiff it can be you know a little annoying um and flannel is a lot softer obviously um so yeah that's partially bless you a question of comfort <coughs> bless you okay. um so right now i'm just gonna cut off the selvage edge of this, which if you don't know, you know, we don't know how many of y'all are like regular sewers or if you're just new to this. So the selvage edge is this edge of the fabric. You can see it kind of has a, a weird little uh, margin. Margin, yeah. Oh, printer's margin. It's got like little holes on it. And that sort of, it warps the weave a little so that it doesn't lay flat completely. So with the nice thing about cotton, right? Which is not something that's true of spandex. You have to like actually cut through everything on spandex. But with cotton, you can just make a little snip. Can you pull the camera over? Just sure, can. Let's see what I'm doing. Yeah. No, can you pull it over? Like close over to Over here, yes, thank you. <laughs> here we go. Right. So if you just make a little snip on the edge, you can just tear it and it's fine. Um, yeah, so we're just going to do that to the other side. Also, this was stuff that we got at Joanne's, I think. Yeah. Well, I shouldn't say that. I think it says Joanne's right there. What was this for? It <laughs> was just a pretty liner. I used it to line the pockets on my winter coat. I don't think it was for anything in particular. It was, it was just, just pretty. It was just pretty and we were shopping at Joanne's already and it was like, oh, We'll use that for something and lo and behold here we are right so you can see i've got this tape on the edge of the table here 
Um, I was using a yardstick yesterday and I found it kind of, not yesterday, the day before, I found it kind of cumbersome. So <clears throat> we just happened to have this masking tape because we're nerds that has a ruler printed right on it. It goes, it only goes up to 12 inches, but you know, it repeats and it is true to measurement. So I taped it down and I made marks at, at nine inch intervals and then different marks at six inch intervals so that I can just lay the fabric down and match it up and just snip along everywhere I marked. And you know, this is a good trick for when you're making more than one. Where did my snip go? Did I just lose it? There it is. <laughs> so we're just gonna cut out that nine. And that doesn't quite make it to nine. So this is going to get saved for experiments with child size math. And then we're just gonna tear along all of those notches. Mm -hmm. And so the nine inch measurement is the horizontal measurement. And then the six inches is the vertical. We're gonna snip again at six inches. And you can save these scraps, even if you're not doing a children size experiments, you can also save them for a non stretch straps. And there we go. There's a rectangle. Easy. <laughs> Instead of cutting it all the way apart. Yep. I'll put you back up on the earth. Do you want to? Nah, go ahead. Okay. Da, 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 da. And then, so like I said, we're going to take two different fabrics so that you know which side is the inside and which side is the outside. Um, it doesn't matter which one is the inside or which one is the outside unless you're using flannel and the flannel is the inside. Um, but just to be consistent about which side you're putting on your face, especially if you're wearing it more than once in between washing it, which most of us are. <laughs> yeah, so you're gonna lay that face to face so that you're looking at the bottom side of the fabric and then pass it over to somebody to make straps. Yay. <laughs> so I've made these straps out of, I said before, seven inch strips of spandex. Um, and sometimes when you stretch them out really hard, they get longer than seven inches. So if uh, you could be so kind as to okay. make sure those are seven inches since you've got the ruler. And if you do not have spandex and you're in the area, contact us and we'll drop you off some because we've got plenty. If you're not in Southern Vermont uh, and you're looking for elastic ties, uh, the current, <sighs> go to Relief Crafters of America and ask. Um, consider also cloth ties. We'll be covering that later in this video. The current thing, the, the current clever hack going around is to use hair ties. And the immediate response I'm seeing from people who actually wear these masks daily is please don't use hair ties because they are really, really strong and they will hurt people's mm, ears. That's fair. I guess if you're going to use, well, no, because you can't change the size of your ties. I was going to say, the uh, yeah. the uh, bias tape, the stretchy bias tape that we've been using, it's also very strong, but you can change the length of that. Yeah. Do you mind if I pull this, uh, if I pull one bit closer? Well, I can pull the, can, the computer down. Yeah. Sorry, we're on the computer since we never quite, we haven't quite reached a thousand subscribers yet. So we stream from a phone, so yeah. you're on a laptop. Yeah. There we go. Is that a good? It is, but do you want to set it down? I'm fine. All right. Okay. It doesn't take super long. Yeah. So I'm going to turn on Wanda. And I'm going to start stitching at the center of the long edge. 
I'm stitching at half speed because otherwise my sewing machine is very noisy. It will scream. It will scream. And we want you to be able to hear us talk. Yep. <laughs> I'm also stitching on a zigzag because I think that fray checks the cotton. You can straight stitch. It's fine. Before you get to the end, I should have mentioned this, but I'm stopping before you get to the end. Before you get to the end of the first edge, you're going to lift up, press your foot, and slide your elastic in there. Elastic, spandex strip, whatever it is. I'm sliding my spandex strip in so that it gets sewn in by that zigzag. You're which sandwiching it in between the fabric. Thank you. I am sandwiching it in between the fabric so that it will... It'll be on the outside where we turn it inside out. Yep. Or right side out. Rather. Yeah, we're all really cautious about the fabric fraying because we're just not really used to working with fabric that frays. <laughs> it makes me feel better to do a zigzag stitch. You do you. I'm sewing down the short end and I'm going to sew all the way down. Is this a stitch that a lot of uh, tabletop sewing machines tend to have? Almost all of them. Yeah. All of them made after mm, 1968. <laughs> that was a random guess. So if you're working on like an old Singer built-in machine, you might not. It's fine. If you're working on an old <laughs> Singer, you're amazing, and I think you're great. Um, so what I just did there was I took the other end of the elastic. Ah, can you see that? There we go. I took the other end of the elastic, and I slid it downward so that the edge of the elastic matches up with the raw edges of the fabric. So you're laying it uh, horizontal, well not horizontal, but uh, perpendicular to that unsewn edge? Correct. It is the raw edge of the elastic and the raw edge of the fabrics all line up. And I'm not sure if the camera is getting any of this because this light is really bright. The oh, wand okay. light is super bright. Um, so say in chat, shout out in chat if you need any other guidance. Can you turn the light off? Um, no, I cannot. Oh, okay. That's silly. Yeah. Uh, the main thing to do is to make sure that you have the full length of the elastic inside your little fabric sandwich so that uh, it will be a full seven inches when you're done. With the ends on either side of the short edge. Yes. I've just caught a thread tail in a thing. <laughs> Pull that out. Sometimes these things happen. I'm going to take a straight pin. Pull my thread tails because I didn't pull them back like I should have. It's also a troubleshooting video. Yeah. <laughs> Again, I'm stopping before I get to the edge. If you're sewing the long side either way, stop before you get to the edge because it is time now to place your elastic in between the two fabric layers. Not right at the corner. Give yourself a good half an inch. Can you see that at all? Yeah, give yourself a good half an inch between the edge of that black fabric and the strap because right there, that's where you want that elastic to be. It's more of a charcoal. It was a custom order for a wedding suit that Eli got commissioned to do. I'm excited to talk about this fabric more. <laughs> On the short end, again, I'm just sewing all the way down the short end. And once again, I have this elastic that's kind of sticking out of the rest of the fabric, and I want it to slide down in there so that the end of the elastic is in between two layers of fabric. Once all of those raw edges are lined up, I'm lifting my press foot up, back down, and on. And then it's getting roughed up, so I lift it up again and put it back down. 
I am not closing this, by the way. We're now on the last edge, the first long edge that we sewed that I already have half of its own. I'm going to leave a gap of two inches. And yeah, we're like three inches. It's going to pull out otherwise, anyway, so. I'm going to leave a gap. I'm making that request yep. <laughs> myself. Gotcha. So now I've sewn all the way around all four edges except for that gap. And that put you down. Yay. I have a thread cutter on the side of my machine, which I love. And this is what your mask should look like at this stage. It's got stitching all around. It has two bits of elastic folded on the inside that you should be able to feel if you run your fingers down this way. All right, now I'm going to come around behind the camera for this next part. Um, and let's see if I can, oh, an error occurred. I'm going to use my computer <laughs> in order to make sure that I'm in frame. <laughs> and I should need that. Yes. There we go, okay. So first we're going to, well, I can do that over here. We're just gonna turn this inside out. Which is always a trick. And don't worry if you pop stitches, it's going to happen. This is why Krista requested that the gap be bigger. <laughs> give it a little shake. And then the convenient thing about having these straps here is that you can just give them a tug and you have corners. All right, so the next step is pleating. The pattern says for this step, pin three tucks, and that's all it says. There's a bit of a lag here. <laughs> right, so I'm going to go about maybe a quarter of an inch here and just fold it over right to the edge of the strap. And then take a pin, stick it in, make sure that the edge is uh, flat-ish. And make sure the head is over the edge so that it's easy to pull out as you're sewing. Let me do that again. Just, I use my nail, I use the tip of your finger, whatever. Pull the fabric over and then squeeze it. And then pin. And then pull the fabric over and squeeze it. And you know, they're not going to be perfectly even. Um, if you feel like you don't have enough on that last pleat, uh, you know, just go ahead and unpin the other two and, you know, make them a little bit smaller. Yeah, I'm going to sit down to do the other ones. Nope. You want me to pull this one back? Cool. Yeah, and this is something that, you know, you'll get a feel for it as you do it. Um, sometimes you need to make sure that the fabric doesn't like pull out of the inside of the pleat. So you might just have to, you know, slide your finger in there just to make sure. Okay, there we go. But yeah, you'll get a feel for how wide the first one needs to be in order to still have room for the last one. Oh, and try not to pin the strap <laughs> to the rest of the mask. That's also important. I have certainly sewn a strap into a mask before this week. It happens. There we go. That's pinned. Yay. So what we have now is a face mask with 
three tucks pleated on the edge. If you have any questions up to this point, toss them in chat. We'll yeah, answer please. them. Yeah, happy to. Um, the next step in the pattern is to top stitch around the edge twice. So this is going to be another sewing adventure, and I'm going to bring the camera a little bit closer to Wanda again. I'm going to try something slightly different this time. Um, do you want to get a stand, actually? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Turn it. Oh, well, I think you need to get it because there are wires here. <laughs> OK. One moment. <laughs> Lift up. Yep. You know, this is only our second live stream, so we... And it's our first one at home, yeah. which is always an adventure. All right, so here we are, close to Wanda, hopefully in a way that you can actually see what's happening now. Um, can you dim these overhead lights? That might help, I think. Yep. They're reflecting off of this. All righty, sound off in chat whether that's better or worse. I hope that's better. What I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be taking, hmm, actually it's going to be just a little bit lower. Uh, grab the tomato pans. I'm going to be taking this mask and I'm going to be stitching all the way around it once at a margin of about a quarter inch. Yeah, much better. Okay. And just so you know, we're not going to go through step by step every single mask we make. We just wanted to lay out like the steps, how we were doing it based on our pattern. And after this, we're just going to sew and chat and yeah, answer questions if you've got any. Yeah. So the nice thing about a quarter inch margin is that it's often on your presser foot of your machine. So as long as you just set the mask under your presser foot and put the edge of the fabric on the outer edge of the presser foot here. Still quite difficult to see. Let's see what I can do about that. Uh, nope. Okay. Oh, we'll figure it out. Uh, put the edge on the fabric under the edge of your presser foot. And now I'm going to start doing just a straight stitch all the way around. When you get to a strap, which you will pretty soon, go over the strap once, and then hit reverse and go back. Then go over a third time. It's important that the straps are anchored in the fabric. That's why you go over the strap a couple of times by going forward, back, forward. Once you've gone over that first strap, odds are you're here on the short side and it's time to start going over the pleats. If your machine is like mine and isn't super powerful, this is now a time where you may want to decrease the speed of your machine because that will stop it from hanging up as it goes over the little mountains here. I'm currently on half speed. When I was on full speed, this machine stalled out. Also, it was very loud. <laughs> also, it was very loud. Um, and it just stalled out again on half speed. So what I'm doing there is I'm decreasing it a little bit more, and I'm lifting up the presser foot and dropping it back down. The other thing that I'm doing, you can see my hand here, I'm actually pulling on it to help the fabric get through the machine. Your mileage may vary because your machine may vary. It undoubtedly does. Yep. Um, when you turn a corner, I forgot to mention this the first time, turn a corner by lifting a presser foot, sliding, swinging that fabric all the way around while the needle's down, and then dropping the presser foot again. Now I'm on a long edge that has no particular bumps or valleys in it, so I'm just going to go straight down the long edge. I'm going to notch my machine back up to half speed. Here we go. I'm also going to take this moment to talk about this fabric because it was a custom printed cotton for a friend's wedding suit. They wanted a cotton suit because their wedding was in July. And we went back and forth over several different designs uh, and fabrics until they picked out this one, which was exactly the one that they wanted. 
and it was the first time ever that I'd made a full suit, and I was so proud of myself. It was, um, it was the jacket, the pants, a vest, and the shirt. Yeah, and this fabric was the jacket, the pants. Yeah. Uh, we've come. I've come to my second short edge, and you will notice that I pulled. Some of you may notice that I pulled one of my pins out already, and I did that just so that there would be room for the presser foot to go. If you find you need to unpin something, do so. And now I have a pleat that doesn't have a pin in it, but I'm still going to just use the presser foot and so to hold it down as I sew over it. And I'm also going to have my hand on the strap back here to pull it through. And it hung up a little, so I'm lifting the presser foot up and dropping it back down. This is pleating. When you pleat something, you triple the number of fabric layers that are going on there. And some machines will put up with that, and some machines will not. Don't mind the noises in the background. I'm just ripping more fabric. <laughs> it's nice to have two people doing this, because one person can be doing prep steps while the other person is doing other things. Yeah. So I've just come all the way around my first line of top stitching. My second line of top stitching, I'm going to place in between the first line of top stitching and the edge. Uh, I'm going to, I don't even have to lift the needle. I'm just going to let my sewing machine go, drive forward and change lanes a little bit with the stitching so that the stitching line, the second stitching line comes in between the first stitching line and the edge. Uh, there's also no need to double up on the straps when on your second round. So what I'm doing here, I'm going to try and stop blocking the camera with my arm. Uh, I'm going to swing the fabric to the, to the left a little, to my left a little. I'm going to take a few stitches. And that was all I needed to chain lanes. And now I'm going to swing the fabric straight on, back to where it was before, so it's straight on. And now I'm going to go down this long edge. I love top stitching because, among other things, the act of doing this presses down the edge of your mask. So all, all the bumps that you made from pleating, all the bumps that you made just from sewing it and then turning it inside out, those bumps are flattening out because you're running it through a machine that is pressing this sandwich flat as it sews it through. Yeah, you saw that it was, you know, puffy when I turned it around and was pinning it. Um, if you look at uh, my mask, right? This has not been ironed at all. This has gone through the wash uh, once. Yeah, times, and it's yeah. just flat. So you don't even need to pull out the iron if you don't want. Top stitching makes the edges crisp. It's why it's such a valuable skill in suit making and shirt making, and also why I almost never do it when I make spandex undergarments. <laughs> I'm coming from a land where we want nice, soft, round edges. I've done my second round of top stitching. I've come all the way around again to the point where I changed lanes. And now I'm overlapping my second round of top stitching for about half an inch. And then I'm lifting my needle, lifting my press foot, sliding it out. That's it. There's a mask. There's one side. There's the other side. There's a pair of loops. It's still connected to the machine by a thread, so I'm going to cut those. Forward. And that's it. That's going to head straight to Brattleboro Memorial Hospital and someone there. Well, now I'm going to cut some straight threads. <laughs> then it's going to head to Brattleboro Memorial Hospital and someone there is going to wear it. And I hope you now have a mask that is going to head to someone who needs it.
or if you don't, you will by the time we finish this. Oh yeah. Whatever uh, that is. <laughs> everyone's gonna need one at some point. Right now, the urgent need is healthcare, and also just because the urgent need is healthcare doesn't mean there won't be non-urgent needs for literally everyone really soon. You wanna put the thing back on the counter? Yeah, I'm gonna move this back a bit. So I want you all to know, because I need to, I need to inform Eli about this. This ah. strip of fabric was just about, it was a little over nine inches, um, but going this way. So that means that the, the scales oh, no. are going to be going sideways, <laughs> which we never like to do. Like we, there's this whole, so our, those of you who don't know us, <laughs> Uh, our very first binder um, that we advertised with was uh, one of those teal metallic uh, mermaid scale prints. Um, and we feel strongly that the scales should be pointing down, right? If you think of a fish, the scales start at the head and they taper down to the tail. So if you're a human being and in theory you had scales, they would point down. But so many uh, factory made, commercially made fabrics point them up for some reason. <laughs> would you pass me the uh, measuring tape? Yes. Um, yeah, we feel strongly about making sure that the scales are pointed down, but you know, needs must. <laughs> That's the other thing about this. Again, it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be, the fabric doesn't have to be going the right direction. What they need out there right now is something, what everyone needs out there right now is something that will keep them from touching their nose or mouth. Yep. That is the most important function of a cloth mask. It's comfortable enough that you can wear it all day and you train yourself out of touching your nose or mouth if you're like me and you have this habit, which I realized after watching the last live stream, wow, I touch my face a lot. <laughs> um, wearing a mask over the past week has helped me train myself out of that. Um, you learn how not to do that, uh, just wearing a mask around. And uh, I keep seeing this over and over in the news that uh, transmission of really any flu or cold related virus, the most often transmission is when you touch your nose or you touch your mouth. It is hand to mouth. Or your so eyes masks. sometimes also. Your eyes are very vulnerable. Yeah. But you can't put a mask over your eyes. No. <laughs> but even so, if you have a mask on and you go to touch your eyes, I have found that like the feeling of the mask against my face as I lift my hand is often enough to be like, no, yeah, don't do that. Don't do that, Eli. Do, do you need to turn the lights back up or is it? I think it's good. Okay. Yeah. It just feels dim here. <laughs> so the next mask I'm going to sew is one that does not have elastic or spandex or any sort of stretch material. I'm using a piece of bias tape which again, I got at Frank's Bargain Center and I kind of love because it's got all these stars on it and it's pretty. And having pretty things is important. And I am going to start a mask the same as before. Uh, There's one's right here. Yeah. Uh, this one is going to have blue and blue with white circles on one side and that pretty flowers that we like on the other. Uh, I'm going to start a mask the exact same way as before, starting from the center and sewing to the end. But instead of sewing the... Sorry, words, words, words. Instead of putting an elastic in between uh, the two layers, I'm going to put this in between the two layers exactly where the elastic would go. Yeah. Is it going exactly where the elastic would go? Because... Oh, this is, this is your, your, these are going to be ties. Yes. Which means I don't need two of them. I need four of them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thinking this out as we do it. Yeah. Cause we've just been using the, uh, the spandex bias tape and the 
spinach strip so far. Yeah. So we haven't, but you're going to get to watch us experiment with this. <laughs> Sweet. So what I have right now is four strips that are each 15 inches in length. And that seems to me to be more than sufficient for the purposes of getting it from the side to the back of your head. Um, and if it's not, well, we'll figure that out as we get there. But I'm going to start like I did before at the center of the long edge, sewing from here to here. You like that. Also, hi, how are y'all doing today? Yeah, where are you, where are you tuning in from? We're really curious about that since we didn't really ask that last time. Are there any locals here since we did share it to our local Facebook page? Mm. See if anybody answers. <laughs> I wonder if our stream is don't have high like quality on. Yeah, that's fine. It's just on a delay. I think that's just the way it works. Mm. I've got it here. <laughs> I appreciate you. Hey. Well, hi, North Carolina. Hey. I think my, I'm not sure if they're there yet. My aunt and uncle bought a house down there to retire in. All of our custom print fabric comes from North Carolina. Does it? Yeah. Oh, right. Spoonflower is based in North Carolina. Yeah, North Carolina is cool, man. So, for these, I am going to, instead of sewing the same elastic in twice, I'm sewing a different piece of bias tape into each corner. But make sure the entire thing is sandwiched in between the fabric. Yep, you've got to coil your ties up to get them inside that fabric sandwich because other than the one edge, you don't actually want to go over this fabric tie a second or third time on account of then your the fabric tie will be sort of stuck along the edge of the mask. And where New York, Massachusetts, and Connecticut meet. Meet. New York, Mass, and Connecticut. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I can I can picture that. That took me a second. It's always uh a little weird. I grew up in New Jersey, like around the, uh, the greater New York City area. So I'm still getting used to remembering that the rest of New York exists up here. <laughs> and like when pe people say New York, they usually mean like way upstate, maybe Albany. <laughs> I mean, they mean the state. <laughs> yeah. Well, because we're, we're like an hour uh east of the border to new york um so we do get a lot of you know crossover and so people say oh we're going to new york and it takes me a second to realize that they don't mean that they're driving five hours into the city <laughs> sometimes they do mean that though sometimes they do mean that <sighs> Or like when they say the city, sometimes they'll mean Keene, New Hampshire. Sometimes they'll mean Boston, but they never mean New York City. <laughs> Meanwhile, I come from Texas and we don't call New York a city. <laughs> well, you grew up in a city. Yeah. I didn't grow up in a city. I grew up <laughs> in a suburb. So one thing I'm finding about these cloth ties is that I really do need to tuck them all the way in and make sure that they're all the way in because there's a lot more material here than there is for the elastic ear loops. So I'm being kind of careful to make sure it goes that way. <sighs> so where in Texas did you grow up, Eli? Let's keep the chat going. Hey, I grew up in Austin. Now. Austin, uh, you may remember from elementary school geography, is the capital. But what that really means is that it's in the very middle of a state that takes 10 hours of driving to get across. <laughs> so 
if you want out of Texas, you've got a long ways to go if you're in Austin. And if you want out of Texas for all of the uh, usual godless commie reasons of being, I don't know, gay, uh, it's often easier to go to Austin than to leave the state. So Austin becomes this sort of oasis for a while of um, hippies. hippies, commies, gays, what have you. Much like Vermont. Yeah. <laughs> but then the 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 tech boom hit and these little companies called IBM and Dell kind of rolled through Austin, Texas. And uh, now it's kind of half a liberal oasis and half, eh, let's say a third a liberal oasis and a third tech bro central. And uh, between those two, the live music scene is really cool and important in Austin and has been for a while. You may have heard of a little festival we do there called South by Southwest. Um, Which unfortunately got pushed back this year. Also, both my sisters in Austin are musicians. And so I uh, One of them is also strong. an actor. Yeah. So I've done something silly. Um, one of my ties did not make it into the scene. Whoops, that's not a big deal. All I have to do is place my tie where I want it to be. Make sure that the edge is up against the edge of the seam. And then I'm going to turn all this back inside out and sew over it again so that this time the stitching actually catches. If you make a mistake, don't worry about it. There's a way forward. Yeah, meanwhile, if you drive 10 hours from where I lived in New Jersey, uh, which was, it was on the easternmost side. I was one town over from uh, the Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> uh, if you drove 10 hours from there, you would end up in Indiana. <laughs> New Jersey's a very small state. It's actually, I think, I, th I looked this up once. I think it's like a thousand square miles smaller than Vermont. <laughs> I believe that. But like Vermont feels smaller because so much of us are mountains that we can't do. Well, Vermont also with. Vermont also feels smaller because it has like a tenth of the population of New Jersey. <laughs> Half a million people or so, yeah. So that worked. And now I have uh, four ties that are around my mask and I'm going to pleat it. Uh, number one, Fander says they have a non-binary non -binary musician friend in Austin. Nice. Do you want to pleat? Yeah, pleating, thank you. I'm the pleating person. Yeah. What do they play? Are they like in a band? Are they like classical? For the record, my sister is a cellist and a really, really good one. The older younger sister. The older younger sister is a cellist. The younger younger sister is an actor and a really good one of both. And also plays the violin and also plays the piano. Emma's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> also, it's Emma's 18th birthday. It's true. My youngest sibling is an adult today. <sighs> I have so many feelings about this, y'all. All of my siblings are in our 30s. <laughs> We're all only like two years apart. So my youngest, my youngest sister just turned 18 and she was born when I was in high school. And I have so many memories and feelings. Well, I was just oh, uh, they're in a band, but also do solo stuff, mostly guitar. Nice. My dad plays guitar. Mm. Um, yeah, I was just remembering yesterday. Because I call my little brother my little brother, um, even though he's just two years younger than me. And I didn't realize this was unusual or weird or gave people the wrong impression um, until I was in high school, because we were we were really close growing up. And uh, so I would, you know, talk about him with my friends and uh, I would, you know, eventually I was like, oh, yeah, my little brother is coming to, to the school next year. And some of them looked at me like, I thought when you said your little brother, you meant that he was like a little kid. I'm like, no, he's just two years younger than me. 
Oh. He's your littlest brother, Griffin McElroy. Is that, <laughs> is that sort of thing? Well, it, it's the right first initial. <laughs> <laughs> this has now been pinned and pleated, so I'm going into the top stitching stage, and I'm going to stitch all the way around it twice. Uh, I woke up from a dream this morning where uh, the three oldest Robins of <laughs> Batman and Robin uh, had been cast as the McElroys, and I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. Naomi Craig says, all my brothers are my little brothers, right? This I only have yes. one little brother. I have one older brother, so I'm like sandwiched in between the two of them. <laughs> And the only reason I know that Indiana is about 10 hours away from New Jersey is because my little brother now lives in Illinois and it takes us like 13 hours to get there, to drive there from, uh, well, my, yeah, my, my former childhood home is no longer where my mother lives, I was about to say. The youngest is 28, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My little brother turned, how old am I? <laughs> he turned 33 this year. Ah. Did you want me to answer that on live stream? What? How old you are. What? Nothing, never mind. It's fine. Okay. I Sorry. missed something. It's okay. <laughs> I'm still thinking about uh, the, the sign on, I'm your sweet baby brother, Griffin McElroy. And he's our age, like 33, 34, maybe? Yeah. I don't know. Ish. He's in our cohort. Oh, you were, uh, yeah, it was a rhetorical. I was asking myself how old I was. Okay. I was trying to remember. <laughs> yeah. At least I was, you know, I was born on a, on a five year. Well, we both were. So it makes it easier to count, especially when we're in a round number. <laughs> So much unraveling. Fray. Cotton <laughs> frays. Did you know that? <laughs> I'd forgotten that. When was the last time we worked on non stretch fabric, really? Let's see. I've been working on my woolen winter coat for about three years on and off, and like a half an hour at a time. But I think the last time that I really like focused on non-stretch fabric was that wedding suit and gosh was it fun because in addition you saw the the charcoal uh that was a constellation fabric but the vest was this bright pink just this absolute pop of pink against the dark gray and it was just so much fun to do and yeah god that was a great time uh jimmy says we'll be hitting a prime number this year hey 35 is a prime number, right? No, it's not. No? Seven by five. Any oh, five, yeah, that's right. Any five is I always just prime. think like, oh, yeah, it's all the odd numbers that are prime numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's true that all prime numbers are odd numbers, yep, right? But that's not the all. Other way. Oops. That's the other way around. So what but, just happened there with me? I just broke a needle. Oh, um, no. Yeah. Did you remember to bring extra needles? <laughs> yeah, they're in here. Um, no. Oh, two things happened to me. One of them was that I broke a needle, which was because I wasn't paying attention and I went too fast over too many layers. And the other thing that happened to me is that I ran out of a bobbin thread like 10 oh, yeah. inches back. So I'm going to switch out my bobbin and switch out my needle oh. and ask Krista to mm -hmm. uh, replete yeah. since I unpinned all those pleats. Does this bobbin fit in there? Probably. It's just been hanging around. Nice. I mean, not that you necessarily need it. It's just, I keep forgetting to bring it back to work. Totally. So yeah, I don't know if you can see that. Uh, maybe, but I just broke the tip off of that needle, which is a thing that happens. It's especially a thing that happens when you're not paying too much attention because you're also chatting. And that's why you always have extra needles in the little drawer bit of your sewing machine. And if you run out of extra needles, you put out a call to your local crafters group and someone else will have a hundred pack. <laughs> wow. And then slide that needle back in and screw it in tight. Oh, it's also possible that I shouldn't have been using my smallest needle because the smaller ones are a little bit because they're more slender. 
they're a little bit more delicate. That's fair. That makes sense to me. Number one, Sandra says it's the worst when you run out of bobbin thread and don't notice it. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's what I did. That's what I did. Where's the thing that I was just sewing? There it is. You had it. Yep, you asked me to redo it, to replete it. So yep. I repleted it. Thank you. There, now I have a full bobbin. And I'm going to restart where my bobbin thread ran out all the way back here and go on. I'm just going to match up rectangles. Yeah. Let's see. We talked about how masks are important even when they're not the perfect material. Mm -hmm. What else were we going to talk about today? Um talked about elastic versus cloth ties. Yep. Hmm. I feel like that was mostly the plan. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, for folks who have just come in, I do want to mention where to donate these. Um, in the description to this video, you will find drop-off points for Brattleboro Memorial Hospital, uh, drop a uh, send to address for Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center, and I believe I also put in the drop off information for Grace Cottage Hospital, uh, which Grace Cottage Hospital up in Townsend um, kept both of my grandparents alive on multiple occasions. So I feel really honored to get to do something to help them out right now. Um, so there's that. Um, if you are not in the Southern Vermont, Southwestern New Hampshire area, please do check out the Relief Crafters of America. The links to that are also in the description down there. And it's a super good space where you can find your local recipients in need. Uh, they are taking requests from healthcare professionals right now. And they, uh, if someone in your area will contact them and say, hey, our office needs 20 masks like right now and they will the the hub distributor person of relief crafters of america will get masks from you to them yeah i think for the most part it seems like hospitals are using the pattern that was posted on deaconess yeah um but definitely still check to make sure you know and that pattern on deaconess is essentially the one that we are making right now yes it is uh the pattern that I link to in the description that Brattleboro Memorial Hospital has released is the Deaconess pattern with a few more instructions on it and uh, some, some guidelines, which I encourage you all to read. Uh, but they say, essentially, they say things like, if you have any of these symptoms, please do not make masks. And they have a list of symptoms, things like that. Isn't it? There's also like, you know, make sure you wash uh, the fabric ahead of time just to pre-shrink it. So hot water, uh, high heat in the dryer. Um, Cotton is so weird. <laughs> well, it's like, it's uh, it's similar to wool, Yeah. right? It, it has a natural curl to it. So even if you, you know, you've processed it to this point where it's nice and smooth, it, the um, the fibers still want to constrict, and that's why we'll also uh, will shrink. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you think of it like hair, because that's what it is. Um, when you wet your hair and then use heat on it, it will just naturally, if you have really curly hair, it will just naturally poop back up because those are, um, they're physical bonds. God, I was a former hairdresser. I went to beauty school. <laughs> I was about to say, <laughs> please, Professor Krista, do yeah. tell us all so about So these are, the, these are, I, they might just be called simple chemical bonds. Regardless, uh, they are, the, the bonds that uh, create the curl in your hair uh, they can be broken just with water or heat. Um, and that's why, um, 
when you say have bed head, right? And you have this cowlick that's sticking up, uh, you can just wet a comb and just comb it down a bit and it'll stay down. That's why flat irons work. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's why flat irons work. That's why blow dryers work. And it's why wool shrinks in the dryer. Yes. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's this. I mean, I imagine it's very similar for cotton, but cotton being a plant fiber instead of an animal fiber might make something different. About that. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. it does. Um, but it still, it reacts in a similar way, but possibly yeah. not as extreme. Yeah. Oh, um, sometimes you will have, you will find that you have a uh, yard of spare fabric in your, I just touched my face again. <laughs> I only scratched my nose, but still working on it. Sometimes you will find that you have a yard of spare fabric in your drawers, in your crafting space, uh, and you don't really know for sure what it is. And uh, the hospitals are asking for 100% cotton, or at least ours is, and everyone that I've seen is asking for 100% cotton. Right, because cotton is really easily uh, disinfected. Yes. That's why, as well. yeah, that's why every linen you will find in a hospital is cotton. The, the sheets, the gowns, uh, the scrubs, yeah, everything. Yeah. So there's a way to test if your fabric is cotton or not. Uh, and it is not something for kids to do and is not something to be done without supervision because it is a burn test. You do need like a safe space, which is to say outside or worst case scenario in a metal bucket uh, in which you have a match and a few fibers of cotton. Um, if it melts at all, it has plastic in it. That's the first thing. If it burns, but it smells like burning hair, it's wool. If it burns and it smells like burning paper, it's cotton. That's the rough, that's the quick and dirty. I will link later when I remember to do this at the end of the stream, I will link in the description to a more detailed burn test, but that's the, the rough. The gist. Uh, yeah, that's the gist of it is, uh, you can tell a synthetic because it melts before it ever touches the flame. When it just gets close, the fibers kind of curl back and round out into little globs of plastic. Yeah, if you think of, if you've ever like burned the end of like one of those uh, rope ties on like a book bag or something, that's what it does. That's kind of the, the effect that you're looking for. Yeah. I just made a mask with ties. These uh, masks with cloth ties, non-elastic masks, can be really good for folks with extra big heads, folks with sensitive ears, uh, any reason you might have to want something that's super adjustable because they can be tied at any point. Um, something that uh, doesn't have to pull on your ears, uh, that can trigger migraines in some folks. Cloth ties. If you don't have elastic in your home, you can still make a mask. What I've got right here is four strips of bias tape. Um, I would not recommend making it out of just a plain strip of cotton. You would need to sew that cotton shut and make bias tape because otherwise it will just unravel. But I think cloth ties are a really good alternative. Um, the one pattern I saw that was made by a nurse which she made and published for free before she went into the trenches about two and a half weeks ago. Um, she had a whole page of preface before the pattern about why she prefers cloth ties. So like... Was this what you were reading that mentioned like sores behind your ears from wearing the masks for so long? That was Twitter. That was nurse Twitter uh, mentioning sores behind the ears from wearing the mask for like eight hours. But yeah, that also made me think of it. Um, some folks, some nurses on Twitter, who, or who I saw briefly on Twitter, you know, nurse Twitter is kind of a weird space these days because they will appear, they will tweet once, they will get 20,000 retweets, and then you will never hear from, you won't hear from them for another 48 hours, and then they will appear again and say one thing or post one photo, and then they're gone, because um, that's how life is. And so one of these photos that got posted and then retweeted a million times was someone wearing a mask like this with ear elastic. And then they put a paper clip. Sorry, I hope you can hear me. They put a paper clip right here. If you can't, uh, what they're saying is that they put a paper clip where their Eli's uh, fingers are um, to hold the straps off of the ear. 
so that it's not like tugging against because that's really it's sensitive skin back there yeah especially if you've got like that's a really common place to have psoriasis yeah oh the other thing was people who wear headbands uh some of them sewed buttons to their headbands and hooked the mask elastic around the buttons so that it's anchored to something right there that is not your ear and i thought that was really cool that's uh probably like a really good solution if your elastic is really narrow too because it's going to dig in so hooking it around a button makes a lot of sense also i want you all to see this fabric that chris is ripping up right now <laughs> because it reminded me of stardew valley and i'm still looking for stardew valley co-op partners so if you want to come play stardew valley with me in the evenings when it's you know the end of the day and everything is happening and happening so fast and sometimes you just want to go farm simulate for a minute i would love to farm simulate with people yeah we know a lot of people are getting into animal cross right now but we don't have animal cross animal crossing crossing <laughs> <sighs> yeah we do not have a switch it's fine i'm just gonna keep sim farm simulating but we do have a steam account and also um Stardew Valley is available on Android and iOS. But you can't play co-op. But you can't play co-op. Yeah. Co-op is only on Steam right now, and that's what I'm really hoping uh, changes in the next update. I really enjoy Stardew Valley as a thing that the developer is just continuing to update four years? Yeah, four years after release. Yeah, that, so. yeah that they're just like, you know what? This is a huge community and people are playing it and I can just keep updating it forever. It's just occurred to me that you've ripped the selvage off of this and selvage is a lot stronger than just a plain strip of fabric. That could probably become ties. Yeah. Yeah. And All selvage right. is very narrow. Yeah. So the selvage on a cotton yard is just going to become ties. Um, I come from a few households uh, that believe in using every part of the cow or the bison or the yard of cotton. Um, so it's really hard for me to let go of fabric scraps. But yeah, we, uh, we regularly fill up a bin. Well, we used to <laughs> regularly fill up a bin of, uh, spandex scraps and drop it off at, uh, the local circus college, uh, the New England College New England Center Center, center mm -hmm. for Circus Arts. NECA. They're great. They're wonderful. I, I love them dearly, and I'm going to link them more. And also, they're just... God, they're so cool. They're such cool people. They're literally like a building in town teaching people how to do circus, how to do trapeze and aerialists and stuff. Uh, Rockhopper Leo says, I love fishing in Stardew Valley. So do I. I'm a fisher. <laughs> my first, my very first farm was uh, the river farm. It's fun once you get used to it. Like, it's it's a little tricky to, to figure out the, the interface. But... For me, there's such a huge gap between the fish that are really easy to catch that I could just sort of sit there and basically they'll leap on my hook versus the fish that I actually need to fill out the community center, uh, which are just awful. Like the, the amount well, of time you, I spent on a puffer fish. If you did it more, then you would level up more oh, and see. have a better rod and have the special. Uh... Are you telling me to get good? <laughs> <laughs> it gets easier to fish once you do it a lot. Yeah. And so like, you know, once you have a bigger bar yeah. to go up and down and it's easier to control then it's easier to get those sort of fish. I don't think I'm ever going to actually catch a puffer fish. Every single playthrough I've bought it from the traveling cart. I I caught one on a I think it was not it wasn't the bamboo rod, but it was the the next one up the fiberglass. Oh my god. Yeah I caught one on the fiberglass rod in my last You didn't even have tackle or a fancy hook. You just caught it. Well I had bait. I just found a good spot. It was like in the corner of that extra beach area over the bridge um, in the shallows. And I caught a whole bunch of red mullets and some red snappers Ooh, and like two pufferfish. <laughs> I need me some red snappers. 
or red mullets, whichever is the one that the apple fairies need. I know they the have snapper. a name. Yeah. I know they have a name, but we always call them the apple fairies. <laughs> Krista, show chat that, show the stream that uh, fabric. Oh, this bird fabric? Yeah, birds. I like birds. So we found this bird fabric. And these are definitely like Northeastern birds. <laughs> They're Eastern US birds, but that's where we live. Yeah, Krista's a birder. I really, really enjoy being married to someone where I can go, oh, there, there's a there's a thing. It, it's got wings and it's sort of red, I guess. And Krista will be like, yes, it's that thing. Yeah, there's only like three birds on here that I can't identify off the top of my head. And like one of them is just because, uh, so there's this, uh, there's a bird called a waxwing and they're very pretty, but there's two different kinds. And it's just, they have a very unique face shape and coloring and the shades of the colors are what's, what uh, delineates which one is the bohemian waxwing from the cedar waxwing and it's hard to t and i can never remember which one's which and it's a little hard to tell on here <laughs> because it could be a question of which colors were available to that fabric printer right <laughs> yeah you know there's there's your robin here and there's a a goldfinch bluebirds I do want to say what we're doing now, and if you're making a whole bunch of masks, this is a good way to do it, is that we are batch processing. And that means there's a pile here of uh, six inch by nine inch rectangles ready to go that Krista has been making. And then they come to me and I stitch all the way around them and do that zigzag stitch that I showed before with the gap in the top. And then I put them aside and make a new pile. And then when Krista feels like uh, not ripping fabric anymore, uh, the next step, they will turn this uh, this part, this piece, this Turn mask, it right side out. Inside and out. And then pleat it. Yes, turn it right side out, pleat it, pin it, hand it back to me, or rather make another pile of pinned pleated masks, which when I feel like I just can't make these anymore, I will switch to top stitching. And when you've got that sort of assembly line going of one task, two task, red task, blue task, uh, <laughs> you end up making a whole lot of things really quickly. And that's how we run our day jobs, you yeah. know, kind of a, a, a more involved version of this. But the uh, batch making process is what can turn uh, an evening of, oh, I will make one mask into an evening of, oh, I'll just knock out 20 before dinner. Yeah, and that's what this tape really makes easy is so I can just snip, 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 snip at each mark that I've made here and then rip it up. Incidentally, uh, to give you an idea, I ran these numbers the other day and what I believe they were was if you have two yards of cotton um, that are the two different yards of cotton, one for the fronts, one for the backs, out of those two yards, you can make 30 masks. It's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Naomi Craig says, this has been fun and informative. Thank you for hosting. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. It's so heartening to me to see the crafters networks popping up all over in our town and other towns, uh, in other states and other countries, people talking to each other, people saying, this is how I'm doing it. This is how they're doing it. This is what the hospital asks for. Um, this is how we're gonna make it is if everyone is making a few, 10, 20, 30, whatever you can do, Maybe whatever you've got. Have a good afternoon, sorry. Bye. Bye. You do. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you've got, uh, whatever cotton you have on hand, if you can make masks out of that and pass them on to your local hospital, pretty soon your local hospital is going to say, hey, we're good, actually. Give it to another one. That's really my goal is to just the three hospitals closest to us, if we can stock them, I'll feel super good about that. 
And we can't do that on our own, so we're going to try. Uh, but there are a bunch of other, like, we're not the only clothing business in town. Yeah. Um, there's a, a woman down the hall from us who just moved into the cotton mill, uh, and she's a tailor. Her name is Nancy? Nancy. Yeah. yeah. Um, what's the name of the? The Right Fit. The Right Fit. Yeah. Right. And she... She, she does tailoring, she does uh, clothing restoration. Yeah, so she's also been uh, making a lot of face masks. She has a lot more cotton on hand than we do. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, we've been seeing a lot of people, a lot of local folks saying, you know, oh, I have all this cotton and I wanna help out. And I'm a sewer. Just wanting to be pointed in the right direction. So we're hoping this video helps you out and points you in the right direction. Um, we're getting on towards almost 4.30 at this point. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I think I'm going to finish this mask and uh, answer any questions you have. If you have any questions, put them in chat. If you're watching this later and you have any questions, put them down in the comments. We'll give you an answer. Yeah, we're not uh, planning on like stopping right now, right? Yeah. We're, we're going to go until things start winding down, I guess. Um, I do have a thing I found. Oh, okay. That's fair. It's my little sister's oh, 18th right. birthday yeah. and it's a party. <laughs> She's not watching. She's busy. She won't see this until after it's over. <laughs> But yes. Uh, so what are the three local hospitals around us? Three local hospitals around us are Brattleboro Memorial Hospital, uh, Grace Cottage County Hospital, and I believe, and uh, Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center over in Keene, New Hampshire. Right. And yeah, check the description for where to hand them off. Yeah, assuming that you're in the area. Yeah. And if you're not, again, check the description for links to the Relief Crafters of America. I really, really hope doing this that uh, the people who get it, the nurses and doctors who get these masks, um, get to have something in the middle of all this that makes them smile. Yeah. That's a, this is one of the reasons that I feel really super good about having a little Stardew Valley sprout fabric or uh, birds or uh, we have like constellations. Yeah, atoms and yeah, pretty flowers. Yeah, colors and patterns and yeah. Because we were talking about this also yesterday. Uh, you know, my mom was a nurse, so I kind of grew up around this whole culture. And nurses love patterns. <laughs> they love like being able to because you know scrubs uh in the hospital at least you know those those classic like teal blue scrubs they're kind of boring um they're kind of sterile and especially the nurses because the nurses work directly with the patients most of the time um more so than the doctors do and so many of the nurses work with kids and so they want something more cheerful and so a lot of well, not a lot of, but every every uh, company that makes scrubs these days makes them in like tons of patterns. And it's very rare to see a nurse just wearing those uh, those teal scrubs these days, uh, if they can help it. <clears throat> like even Disney, <laughs> Disney has a, a license with at least one of the scrubs companies. Because I've seen tons of Disney print scrubs, and they wouldn't let that fly. Yeah. And I just, I really like, yeah, I like thinking about how we're going to send these out, and someone's going to pick it up and be like, ah, that's mine. That's my mask now. And, yeah, increasing the general amount of even the, the smallest, slightest good feeling in the world, I think, makes a difference right now. This is also, before we go, I'm going to get on my soapbox for just a second, y'all. <laughs> Which make, isn't to say that we're leaving right this second. I would like to 4.30. Okay. Yeah. Um, sorry, should have no. mentioned. Yeah. 
but I do want to get on my soapbox for a minute and say that we've made chess binders and sports bras for five years. We've always been making this thing that was considered a medical device and is still medically necessary for a lot of people to live their lives without pain of various kinds. And our deal has always been to make these necessary things feel a little better to wear. And so it makes perfect sense to me nowadays that uh, what we are doing in these times is making absolutely necessary objects out of what we have to hand and what we could grab from our, our locals, our local spaces. And while we're at it, we're making them feel just a little better to put on. And I think that's really important. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Yeah, so if we're shutting things down at 4.30, you've got four minutes left if you have any questions or if you want to chat or if you've got a soapbox to get onto. Yeah. That was my Hannah Hart moment, wasn't it? The dramatic <laughs> music star. Yeah, this is the Stardew Valley soundtrack we've got going in the background. Yeah. Because it's a nice, light, fun soundtrack. And they are songs about being in a small town and making things. That's true. Making things for a community. All right. Used up the last of those scales. Oh my goodness. Let's start turning these. Oh. Uh, Rock Hopper Leo asks if you actually want people to play Stardew Valley with. Yes. Heck yes. Um, does YouTube have a DM function? That you can DM me on. Um, gosh, there's a, a million ways you can reach me. What? How can people reach? Me? Um, well, you could go to our website and contact us through our contact page. <laughs> I guess. Um, I guess you can email us directly. Yes. Um, Eli's email, uh, the work email, yes. is Eli E L I at shapeshifters.co, not .com. Ooh, know what I can do, actually, is I can also just put my Steam friend code. I, I can uh, DM you if, if, or whatever. Yeah, let me message you my Steam friend code, and then we can be friends on Steam and play Stardew Valley together. I can just put it in the chat. Yeah, I don't know what it is. Oh. <laughs> well, we can put it in the description after we're yeah. done. I don't have a Steam friend code because I'm on mobile. <laughs> I because been... I have a I have a Chromebook and Steam doesn't like Google Chrome. And I don't I had to break up with Windows after it completely destroyed one of my laptops a couple years ago. There is apparently a Stardew Valley mod that will uh, make a server that's just always on, like a Minecraft server. So I've been looking into that and like the seconds of free time that I occasionally have. Yeah, we, we in lack, uh, in, with the lack of a, a mobile co-op, we just decided to make two characters together and just play at the same time. <laughs> We've been having sort of tandem farm simulators. One yeah. of these is super longer than the other. Could you measure? Yes, thank you. Two seconds. You can have them. All right, we've got one minute left. Cool. Do you have anything that you want to send out into the internet before we go? I have already sent out everything I think is super important. And oh, eh, maybe one more thing. We're putting a lot of emphasis on our local hospital because I think it's really important to support local right now. Um, best thing you can do is help out the people closest to you. 
uh, people in New York are helping out the New York hospitals. Christian Siriano just sent like a thousand masks out. Super cool. Uh, people in in other people's hometowns, people in, in your hometown, if you're not there, people in your hometown are helping out their, their local hospital. Help your local hospital, wherever you are. It starts at home and we'll all make it through this. How about you? Yeah. Yeah. And it's 4.30 now. Yay. Okay. We're gonna end the stream then. Thanks for coming and hanging out with us. It was really nice to, it was really nice <laughs> to bring you into our home for a change. I'm sorry the cats didn't make an appearance. Yeah, the cats <laughs> might show up in the next live stream. Which will probably be next Saturday? Yeah. We'll just make it a weekly thing? I think we're just going to do this every Saturday afternoon. So watch out for that. Thanks, y'all. <laughs>